Um, we move on now onto our third presentation, the case for creative crafting, multi-crafting in Metropolis Square, Rotta Naxos, and this talk will be delivered by Michael Kaletsos from the University of Michigan. Um, I give you the floor, Michael, when you're ready. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Um, can everyone hear me okay? Okay, uh, yes, excellent. <laughs> Um, so thank you all for being uh, here today, and thank you very much to the organizing committee um, for allowing me to present a little bit of my dissertation uh, work with you all. So the central topic um, uh, of today's paper uh, recognizes the fluctuations in communities of practice among craftspeople during periods of stress and addresses the potential impact on identity formation and transformation resulting from these changes. I demonstrate uh, through a case study um, of legacy data, or uh, albeit a very small one, um, from the settlement of Grada um, on Naxos, um, which date to the late or the later phases of the late Cycladic III period and roughly corresponding to the late Hellatic III C period um, from the Greek mainland, which I will continue to refer to it, uh, to that uh, chronology uh, framework for the remainder of the paper. Um, I am attempting to do this in order to reinvigorate the study of the cyclades at this very critical juncture um, in Greek history. Um, and I tried to demonstrate the active role that craftspeople had in shaping their own communities. It must be said from the outset that I have not had an opportunity to study the materials in question um, in person, but rather that I'm working with data of the preliminary excavation reports and subsequent secondary publications. Um, from this reassessment of the previously excavated ceramic workshop under Metropolis Square in modern Naxos town, um, and uh, in addition to its associated finds, I argue that it is possible for archaeologists to identify changes in the life cycles of communities of practice through the archeological record. Uh, I believe that important shifts to different life stages within the communities of practice within Grada took place um, during the late Hellatic 3C middle and late uh, periods due to a shift towards new forms of creativity and crafting processes as evidenced by the co-production of a series of faience-like ceramic vessels. Uh, important alterations and additions to the chenapatoire or operational sequences of production um, that these potters usually followed um, in, uh, by this particular ceramic community of practice uh, led to a transformation and development of a new and creative community of practice. Uh, it is unfortunate, but it appears that this newly developing community of practice was short-lived uh, as output, output of such uh, specialized products remain quite low. I also suggest uh, that this local workshop produced vessels for super household consumption and maintain close uh, ties with the local uh, elites of Grada and craftspeople uh, further afield um, in the Aegean. The Cycladic world following the collapse of the Mycenaean palaces on the Greek mainland is often examined through a wide macro scale lens that further mystifies the island archipelago and leads to the development of grand narratives that overemphasize the imposition of external forces on the Cyclades and the Aegean region. Far too often, this group of islands is treated as one collective geographic unit and occasionally as its own distinct polit political entity without consideration of the crucial uh, inter and intra variations between each island and the individual communities uh, living and interacting with one another. These issues further obfuscate our understanding of the vital roles and agency of local island communities in reshaping their societies and the wider early Greek world during the post-palatial period. Traditionally, the investigation of the post-palatial period in the Aegean world has been framed within a simplified dichotomy between collapse and continuity. I believe that while this allows scholars to more easily make sense of the many complex processes uh, taking place during this period, 
it uh, does hinder exploration of the more dynamic nature of social interactions taking place between Aegean societies and those throughout the wider Mediterranean. It is unfortunate, but such an approach does not always consider discrepant experiences and the varied responses people may have had or ask how and why such processes occurred. Previous scholarly contributions to this period often center around the collapse of the Mycenaean palatial systems and the supposed complete loss of aspects of social complexity. These top-down approaches are problematic for a number of reasons, but most specifically because they emphasize the agency of elite members at the core palatial centers of the Greek mainland, while relegating members of differing social classes and identities, along with communities in different areas of the Aegean, and in this case the Cycladic Islands, as passive bystanders to the events taking place around them. Additionally, much work has been concerned with the specific causes of the collapse, which include factors such as changes in the environment or natural disasters, warfare, population movements, economic decline, general systems collapse, et cetera. And you can see a very long expensive list here. Uh, these monocausal explanations have been demonstrated to be flawed in several ways as they present a rather simplistic view of the complexities of the time, attempting to, all, to fit all evidence and data in one easily relatable tale. In more recent decades, however, scholars have sought out aspects of continuity in the archaeological record that would connect the intervening years um, from the late Bronze Age to the early Iron Age. This research has proven critical in reshaping how we think about the later phases of the late Bronze Age in the Aegean. Current trends also demonstrate the importance of taking the perspectives of local island communities into consideration in order to give a voice to those who have traditionally not been recognized. As Paul Rainbird emphasizes, it is crucial for scholars to not treat uh, the area of the island and that of the human population as one community. To amend these narratives, it may be more appropriate to operate at the community level or what Carl Knappett and Sander van der Lue uh, refer to as a mesoscale of analysis that is neither top down nor bottom up because it works outwardly in both ways from the middle. Before advancing to the case study at Grada, it will be first necessary to define some of the core concepts and theoretical approaches with which I am contending. According to Etienne uh, Wenger, communities of practice involve groups of people who share a concern or a passion for something they do and learn how to do it better as they interact regularly. Here, the learning does not just happen at the individual level, but rather involves larger groups of people. Active participation and interaction between these people can lead to new developments and transmission of knowledge, learning, and practices. Such a community builds camaraderie and trust between its members. The sharing of knowledge and experiences through interaction and participation help solve problems and challenges that the community may face. Since a community of practice is more informal in nature, it also allows for knowledge to be shared both vertically across generations as well as horizontally among peer groups. This can have a tremendous impact on production processes that may spur changes in material culture and identity formation. It is important to understand that communities of practice do not remain static through time but are subject to their own life cycles of growth, success, decay, failure, and even regeneration at various points in time. Wenger, McDermott, and Snyder outline what they consider to be five stages in the life cycle of a community of practice that is metaphorically compared to a garden, which takes commitment and time in order to uh, lead to growth and development. These five stages include potential forming maturing, self-sustaining, and transformation stages. Uh, the first stage of potential starts with loose connections between individuals who hold the promise of coming together. Because energy levels between members are lower at this development stage, um, it is vital for the leadership to take a more active role uh, with input. A community of practice enters the forming stage uh, when its members continue building connections with one another and begin developing opportunities from their newfound connections. Here, the leadership maintains less direct input 
as the group members begin to support one another. The life cycle continues into the maturing phase where there is an increase in the number of participants and a growing sense of commitment to one another. Due to further investment in these social relationships, members develop greater trust and are more forthcoming with in-depth knowledge. Maturing of the community leads to dips in, or can lead to dips in uh, member energy levels. And here at these moments, leaders will need to um, inv be involved with more structured input um, in order to maintain growth. Finally, the community of practice has the potential to reach a self-sustaining level of growth. Um, and it is here that things appear more hierarchical um, as there's no longer just a, one single leader or a single group of leaders. Um, instead, the members of the community take a more active role uh, with the sharing of knowledge and practices among one another. Energy levels for members may fluctuate between high and low points, but the leadership has far less energy input than in previous stages, um, since members of the community are becoming leaders in their own right. The final outline stage um, in the community practice life cycle is considered the transformation stage. Uh, this phase is usually the result of some type of event that alters the makeup of the community, um, kind of beyond recognition. Such events may include the arrival of large numbers of new members, departure of old members from the community, or a decrease in effort and energy uh, input between members and community leaders. Once this stage is reached, it is necessary to return to an earlier stage or perhaps even put a stop to the community. The question of how to identify changes in the life stages of a community of practice within the archeological record is a challenging one. But I propose that it is possible by looking um, for aspects of creativity. In a recent edited volume, uh, uh, Bender Jorgensen, Sofer, and uh, Stig Sorensen investigate the concept of creativity in the European Bronze Age from a praxis-oriented approach. The authors argue that creativity is an outcome as well as an intention and process, and a realization of ideas um, or ambitions through a particular material in the form of a set, specific set of practical actions. They also note the importance of studying the relationship of creativity to people, materials, contexts, and conditions. Creativity implies the entanglement of ideas and knowledge, as well as experiences and inspiration um, that come from interactions and participation and experimentation with others. This points, or this seems to point toward an important relationship between creativity and communities of practice. Two other important characteristics of creativity that they point out involves or attentiveness, the process of allowing a material to inform the craftsperson on what can be done and how, um, and making connections uh, that others have not yet noticed or achieved. This latter concept involves consideration of the relationship between the existing and new um, in the creative process. I believe that one way these concepts of creativity are physically manifested um, in the archeological record is through multi-crafting strategies, which are evident at the workshop at Grata um, during the LH3C period. According to Izumi Shimada, multi-crafting involves the same or closely related artisans performing a major part for the entirety of two or more distinct crafts involving different media or raw materials in close proximity to each other to produce items primarily for super household consumption. On a related note, multi-craft production uh, describes the concurrent practice of multiple crafts by different individuals or groups, each specialized in one or more crafts in the same space or in a series of adjacent spaces. Meanwhile, the concept of co-production is a form of multi-craft production in which artisans specializing in different crafts may be close to each other, collaborate in a design and manufacture of, of the products, a sort of feedback relationship. It is important to make these distinctions between the different multi-crafting strategies because, because it has implications for understanding the linkage of or chaining of operational sequences of production 
um, of items produced within the ceram ceramic workshop at Grata and understanding the dynamic nature of interactions between craftspeople. Um, and then the next part, I get to the uh, case study. So as we've already seen, uh, the island of Naxos is the largest and most fertile of the Cycladic uh, islands and coupled with its key central position in the Aegean trade networks, it helps um, explain some of the reason for its prominence and ability to rebound uh, following the manifold challenges and changes to the Aegean world after 1200 uh, BCE. The settlement of Grata is located on the northwest side of the island adjacent to the Bay of Naxos. Uh, a river separated the Bronze Age settlement of Grata from its two cemeteries at Kamini and Aplomata. Uh, here you can see uh, the modern entrance uh, to the metropolis archaeological site. Um, and then here you can see uh, a view of the hills surrounding the settlement where both of the cemeteries um, are located. Although Grana's early history is fascinating due to time constraints, I will relegate discussion to the LH3C period or what is commonly referred to as Town Two of Grata. Town Two was founded on a different orientation from the preceding settlement that appears to have been abandoned slowly over time. Uh, the excavators have interpreted this later phase of settlement as being established more slowly on an ad hoc basis. Town two was also smaller in size compared to town one in the LH3B period. But even though the town was smaller and it may appear less organized, there's still plenty of evidence to suggest that the inhabitants of Grata in the middle phase of the late Helladic 3C period participated in a thriving and vibrant community. Um, <clears throat> so there was a much intensive field work um, on the island in the mid uh, 20th century, um, including the work by Nicola Laos uh, Condoleon um, in from 1949 to 1973. Um, and then also the work of Vasileos Lambrinodakis um, from 1978 to 1985, um, where they excavated at Grata and the two main cemeteries. Um, uh, and there was, even though, um, as Christine mentioned, work at the Demetrokali plot, um, there was still continued work within the heart of the settlement at Metropolis Square. Um, and it is due to the contributions of Aliki Bikaki, who supervised the, the excavation um, in this area, that we have preserved uh, valuable insight into this workspace and its associated craftspeople. Um, these excavations took place during the 1980s. Uh, and uncovered the only published space from the site clearly engaged in craft production. While archaeologists are quick to mention that this building is a ceramic workshop from the LH3C period um, based on the permanent installations, tools, stone mold, and some of the other artifacts found, um, a re-examination um, of the site provides a much more comprehensive look um, into the people living and working uh, there. Um, and their potential uh, intra and extra island connections. The ceramic workshop within Metropolis Square um, offers Aegean prehistorians a unique opportunity to examine multi-craft production uh, taking place within the post-palatial Cyclades. Um, and this workshop was located, oh, thank you, um, in 1983 and 1984. Um, and um, in uh, the northeast area, um, two rectangular rooms were found with stone foundations um, and walls composed of mud bricks. Um, and um, let's see, the first larger room contained rectangular bins and basins of unbaked clay. And this is probably where the levigation was taking place. Um, uh, and then there was also in the smaller room, a small bench of unbaked clay um, with small depressions in it, um, where in situ were found uh, two small vases uh, made of whitish clay. Uh, these two vessels were then covered in kaolin, uh, a mineral typically sourced to the island of Milos. Um, and then um, after the application of this kaolin co uh, coating, the potter appears to have applied a bluish green material or paste that could have potentially created a faience-like quality to the vessels once fired. 
um, and it is, excuse me, this is the site. Um, and because there are no actual images, the excavators provided a number of comparanda. So here is this lentoid flask um, from Kitian, which makes uh, a possible interesting connection. Um, and so the area of the workshop and the vessels covered within it um, and the raw kale in materials raises interesting questions about the potters potentially living um, and working within the space in Metropolis Square. On the one hand, from the quantity of locally produced ceramic cooking pots and fine ware recovered from the structure, it suggests that the potters utilizing this structure were well integrated within the local community of pra uh, practice, producing customary shaped and decorated vessels de grata. On the other hand, these potters potentially had access to intrasocratic um, connections who supplied KLN for alterations to the typical um, uh, chanapatoire. Um, and this further supplemented, is further supplemented with Eastern Aegean connection um, that may be uh, considered or termed a constellation of uh, practice. Um, and then I would also mention there was evidence of textile manufacture through some spinning equipment um, that was found there as well. So this all uh, provides some interesting uh, questions uh, for us to look at. And since I'm about out of time, I'm going to move past my last uh, case study and maybe we can talk about it in the uh, discussion, but I'll end uh, now with my conclusions. So um, throughout this uh, short paper, I hope that I have presented some um, of the challenges that investigating the post-glacial uh, cyclades faces. Uh, I believe that by shifting the scale of analysis to the, the meso scale um, through the approach of communities of practice, we have an opportunity to consider variations in the archeological record and what those variations might mean to the local Cycladic peoples who produced and experienced them. It is clear that communities of practice constantly adapted and changed to fit their needs, uh, but it was through active participation, communication, and interaction that challenging times could be faced. Creativity would not end slow, slowly due to economic downturns and depopulation. Such challenging circumstances might even allow communities to reevaluate themselves and alter what may not be working and present new opportunities to make vital challenges. Uh, this case at Grotto presents a fascinating case to explore the impact of multi-crafting strategies on the creative process. So thank you. Um, thank you, Michael. Thank you very much for uh, getting us through um, this. And um, again, um, thanks to all our um, authors that presented on this session. I uh, found it very interesting. Um, uh, all of you really added uh, something new. And I strongly believe that uh, we have to listen to Highlands. We have to listen more to Highland because they have a lot to tell us. Um, and it, it will they will be like, I think, um, the, the new viewpoints into, into very big questions in, in uh, Mediterranean uh, archaeology. Um, so I think it's now time to um, discuss these papers. I would move um, into Michael's presentation. Um, so again, do we have any questions, comments? I'm, I'm sure that um, community of practice uh, you know, always um, grab our attention as archaeologists, and it's a very interesting theory that we can always apply. Um, it's very, uh, Agatha, yes, I can see you. <laughs> I have as well <laughs> some questions, but I, I'm going to keep them. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Michael, for your really great uh, introduction, for vertical introduction, and for bringing um, the creativity under the discussion, which is uh, like one of my favorite approach to analyze craft and craftspeople. But my question will be more coming from the Shen Operatua approach. As, um, as you may know, as I'm a Texas scholar, and we are always very curious about the situation in which textile tools are found in a pottery workshop. Can you please comment more about those textile tools? Do you have any evidence whether they were just used um, in this workshop by its inhabitants or whether they may 
probably have been produced there? That's a wonderful question. Uh, thank you very much. Um, so I think uh, it, it, it seems more likely from the preliminary publications because they are, unfortunately, I mean, they're pretty decent for preliminary publications, but of course, very um, still a little, you know, haphazard um, in what they, what they provide us. I do think, um, based on my understanding of the Greek, is that they were found in a um, near that workbench, um, which is uh, clearly a potter's workbench. But um, if they are definitely, I, I don't think they were produced there. There was no indication of any um, debitage from the ivory. Um, so it seems like they were brought there. And even if they were being stored there, um, they would probably be used somewhere in the near vicinity. Um, and so I think it was for me very striking that this has not been, these artifacts have not, these textile tools have not been picked up on in any secondary scholarship yet. Um, everyone, there is mention of these faience uh, like vessels that are being uh, produced there. But what happens when you have multiple uh, crafts um, taking place um, or activities taking place in the same area. And I mean, we like to, we should be thinking about space as multifunctional. Um, and so I, for me, uh, it would be interesting to consider the possibility that, you know, if you would like to follow uh, gendering of, of uh, crafting activities, potentially you may have, um, men and women working together within that same space, or you may actually have female potters potentially. That is one thing that I didn't get to bring up um, as I uh, kind of rushed through the end of the, the presentation, but I wanted to, to highlight how we, we might um, complicate the narrative um, a little bit. Um, and I think if we take a kind of more microscopic approach sometimes, I think that's also very beneficial um, because we can tease apart um, little uh, little uh, nuances that have not been picked up on before, and that could change our our total understanding of what what happens at, at these sites. And the variability in the cyclades is so great, and we as scholars like to, as both Anna and Christine talked about, just like to kind of group everything together as. Um, is is to completely homogenous and uniform and that just is not the case so, thank, you. thank you thank you it's very interesting and um, i have a couple of um, related questions i was in fact wondering if you could um find um, um i mean i was um thinking in terms of efficiency, if the spindles or any other textile tools are where was used in the same space of pottery production, I was wondering whether the two can be combined and maybe like while attending um, another uh, a work in pot, like uh, a pottery task that maybe requires just surveillance or, or not very much, you know, like hands-on, um, maybe like spindles could be used not to waste time in a way and to combine because spinning, it, it is a very time consuming and, you know, you need a lot, a lot of thread to make um, to, if, so that you can weave, um, you know, clothes for yourself. So I was wondering if you talked about um, this kind of approach. Uh, definitely. So that's something that I was ho hoping to get at in a little more depth. Um, but I think uh, that's a very great point. I think there is something to do with efficiency here because if, um, I mean, there's so many steps um, when you're producing a pot, um, but there are moments where you do have some downtime. So anytime you can be uh, producing thread is going to be important. I mean, any one of us, as some of you may know, we wear roughly two kilometers of thread on us every day. Um, so in the ancient world, you need to produce all of that by, by hand. And that is an amazing uh, feat. So I think any way that people could get the job done um, they would probably do it, whatever is maybe best for the household. Even if that goes against uh, gender norms, things like that, there might be ways, um, you know, for people to, to kind of help out the family. So I think that that also helps with the understanding of the process a little bit more indirectly um, and this kind of notion about um, 
kind of uh, the community of practice, the peripheral participation. So it might not be formal education, but maybe a yes. child has to help help their mother at certain, in certain instances, and that is incredibly beneficial. Um, yes, yes, I totally agree. Um, and um, yes, um, my second question is about, um, it's, it's moving, let's say, a little bit forward. Um, and it's completely based on my research, actually, uh, a, a, a textile archaeologist, as you have uh, guessed. Um, it's my research is based on Cyprus. And I noticed that spindles and loom weight for a certain moment onwards from the Middle Sea period start mm -hmm. appearing in these community places where other crafts appear, but also these um you know like um activities like feasting staying together consuming meals and stuff so i was wondering whether this um like having multiple um crafts up, um, happening in one place could also be an occasion for social life maybe going there spinning your thread and, and talking to another person doing making pottery or, or these kind of things i know this mm -hmm. cannot really be seen in archaeology most of the mm -hmm. times but just wondering if you um, had this impression from the record. yeah yes that's another great point julia and i actually I completely agree with you um there um that's something that i um, when I was working at Olynthus for a few summers, when I we uh, going coming back through the old Robinson excavation reports, finding um, spindle whorls at the the fountain house or in the area near where we think the agora is there. Um, I mean, people could carry that's easily movable and, and portable, and um, I think, yeah, it, it, those are perfect opportunities. To, while you might have to wait in line for water or something like that, you can still be socializing as well as being uh, productive. So I think that's a completely valid point. Getting um, it, at that in the archaeological record is a little tougher, but um, I think that's where maybe ethno-archaeological examples might come in to help support you a little bit. And I can recall... Um, at least, I mean, not for the socialization, but on the mobility aspect, um, Elizabeth Barber's um, book from, I think, the 90s, where she actually has an image of a Greek woman on a donkey uh, riding and spinning at the same time, which I think that just has, that image has burned into my, my psyche. So. Um, sometimes this kind of activity are like Fidgeting activities, so you cannot stop uh, spinning or, or sewing, you know, and it's just your little obsession. Uh, no, great. Yes, I, I I hope we can stay in touch because uh, really we have like our, our research is a, a lot in common. I used our communities of practice as well. Um, so um, that's very, very interesting. Um, Glad to hear that. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Uh, absolutely. Um, I cannot see any questions from uh, the chat. Um, does anybody has a quick question? The last quick question from Michael? Julia, there is a question from Steph and then from uh, me asked by raised hands. Oh, sorry. Oh, I couldn't. Oh, I'm so, so very sorry. Um, so, so the first person where you were, Stephanie, you said? Well, well uh, is uh, is your, yeah, um, Agatha, is your question about textiles still? Because you might as well keep with the textile discussion if that's the case. Uh, it's a very short question about textiles because there was something which I'd like to assure about. Did you mention that the spindle whorls were made of ivory? Yes, yes. The, okay. There was two spindles and then one spindle whorl of ivory attached to the one spindle. Spindle. Wow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So and the and the spindle rod is also made of ivory. Yes, both of them. There, yeah. So there was okay, two. So rods. it's like the Perati set. Yes. Yes, and so that was okay. actually the so, so that slightly changes the perspective, I think, because mm -hmm. these are like considered really a luxury um, mm -hmm. objects. So yes. I think we can perhaps introduce into the discussion the social status of the people mm -hmm. who were exactly. spinning there. So it's really amazing. And do you know whether they were like um, a drop spindle, um, whether lower spindle well or up spindle? Um, um, I, I don't know because they were, um, unfortunately, they didn't provide images of, of them. They just had the comparanda from Parati. If you'd like, okay. I can briefly show you the, the image. No, I know, the, I know the uh, Parati okay. one. And this okay. is okay. the up. So it's like for um, Egyptian technique. It's not mm -hmm. local technique to, uh, to the Greece, mm -hmm. let's say. 
Bronze Age Greece. So this would be interesting if these two are also like the upper spindle spindle wells, because this would show to a foreign spinning oh, considered foreign spinning mm. technique. So this is I, this is this was just a detail I wanted to know. Oh, thank you very thank much. You. That's that's wonderful. I didn't actually know about that, so I'll have to look into that because that, in conjunction with some of the other uh, production that I was talking about, may you know if you want to get at the an idea about identity and where the people living at Grotto were coming from. And that's not to say, you know, everyone, but you do have lots of mobility taking place. And I think the settlement at Grotto had to be a very diverse place. Uh, I just wanted to ask you about the communities of practice as well. Um, it's obviously like an idea that everyone's very interested in. It's a, it's a really nice idea. I, it's like a two part question. One is, um, particularly because we're dealing with small communities, it's likely that the people who are in the um, community of practice are also related in lots of other ways as well. And, and not just kinship and things like that, but it's kind of like lots of different possible layers. So I was wondering how that can get integrated into the model. And then the second part of the same question is that means that there's possibilities that uh, for a useful cost cultural stereotype, you may be in a community of practice that includes your mother-in-law. Um, and that kind of completely changes the dynamic. And as I say, it sounds like a community of practice sounds like a really nice idea. And it sounds like uh, the way that we craft now, where it's kind of like something that we want to do. And I'm just wondering, like, how do we deal with communities of practice that involve horrible people? Exactly. Yeah, that's a fantastic question. Um, uh, so I guess maybe I can start with the, the second part. Um, you might have to remind me about the first part because that, that is something, uh, Stephanie, that I um, really enjoy that question. Um, so there is this issue with communities of practice is coming across as a over, overtly very positive. Um, and um, I think for me, that's partially why I'm so drawn to it um, as well. But I... Um, I guess it is based from more modern um, business uh, conceptions and modern business um, of how the ideal of how things should run. So is like the chart that I was showing you with the life cycles, is that I, ideal uh, in that case? Yes. But is that reflecting reality? And I would say the answer is no. And that's um, part of what I'm hoping to do in my dissertation is kind of complicate um, this, this um, simplified ideological model. Um, and so I guess one thing that I didn't get, um, get to discuss because um, I ran out of time, I had a brief kind of secondary case study that looked at some of the ceramics coming from the uh, tombs. Um, and there, I think um, I was, uh, there's something interesting that Andreas Vlacopoulos mentions that they are locally produced. There's a series of six uh, variety of vessels. So they're in the same shape and form and they conform very much to other locally produced Naxian pottery. But the clay from them is uh, kind of like weird greenish white color. And so without kind of any um, scientific analysis of the clay and not having seen them myself, I can't really compare. So I have to I kind of take that um, at his word uh, for now, um, unless I misunderstood. But if those are locally produced, that might be some indication of a potential like aspect of competition or kind of resistance um, within these communities. So you have someone clearly who is possibly trained um, within the community and are forming vessels in the same way, but perhaps they're trying to gain maybe a competitive advantage uh, with this different type of clay. And what I wanted to go into that on the life cycle aspect, it doesn't work if that was the case. Um, there's only six vessels remaining and actually the, the pigmentation or the, the color, coloring decoration is kind of uh, encrusted and falling off compared to the other locally produced stuff. So clearly this clay may have been um, inferior, but it, 
may have been an experiment to try and gain some kind of competitive edge. So I don't think communities of practice necessarily need to um, have to have the kind of positive connotations um, that we like to always associate it with. And maybe it is over the past year of me trying to have a more positive <laughs> attitude. Um, but yeah, I do think we can see potentials for, for conflict. Um, so I think that it might answer your second question. Can you go back and repeat uh, the first first question? I'm sorry. Of course. No, I, I do exactly the same all the time. I was just wondering how you would integrate other types of identity or kind of like on top of the uh, community of practice. Yes. So I briefly alluded to the term constellations of practice, which I think is um, kind of a uh, a broadening of the, the community concept. Um, and so this kind of shows a more entangled network. Um, what I like about communities of practice as opposed to kind of other forms maybe of social networking is that it is a little bit more personal and you get at that idea of interaction. Um, so I think this constellation idea is a little bit more personal than maybe entanglement, but I think those are all like social networks and entanglement theory is also a very valid and, and a worthwhile um, way to approach it. But I think for me to get at that, those kind of personal connections, I think you can start to map these kind of overlaying um, identities potentially um, through like kind of expanding and, and kind of exploding out um, the, the community of practice. So it is almost like this constellation and for a time I've been thinking about this metaphor of you know supernovas and when a community of practice goes bad and and things need to regenerate so they may come back like a collapsed you know star um, but they might not be as powerful as they kind of once were and so maybe there's something to that but I think that might be one way you can try and look at other forms of um, identity but looking considering gender social class um, and even, you know, I, I think those are uh, possible avenues to explore as well. Great, thank you. That was absolutely a great discussion. Um, thank you. Okay, thanks very much, Julia. Um, that was a, a really uh, well handled um, you know, sharing your ideas about islands coming from Cyprus and then, you know, the ideas about islands coming from the Cyclades, again, you know, we've managed to achieve a great fit there in terms of the chair and the session subjects. So we're, we're really pleased with that. Um, 